All right, guys. This is some pretty hefty correlations we've been working on. I could have done some static posts, but I know that it's it's going to be easier if I put some uh, some uh, verbiage, vocal verbiage behind it to try to extract the most information from uh, what I'm seeing right now in these big picture charts. So let's start, guys, with the SPX divided by the PPI. So good old uh, PPI breaking out or SPX breaking down versus PPI. We've seen this over and over again. The 1920 bull run for SPX breaks down, and we know what this was a bear market for US equities where US oil, silver, or gold was pegged. Uh, they were outperforming US equities. Same thing here breakdown even there's maybe a more acute one here breakdown nifty 50 the gold go 60s breakdown silver gold go crazy here same thing here 2000s is breakdown and we have another one right here but our goal is to try to reduce whipsaws to augment us of establishing the highest probability roadmap is we can't just look at one racial chart because that was the mistake I used to do back in my early days when I started to do chart trading because it was overwhelming. I just look at one chart and that's it, Pat. Just that chart. If it's breaking out that chart, that's what I'm going to play. But I didn't take a step back. I didn't have a bigger time frame enough to see previous cycles. I wasn't looking at racial charts. So let's say I was trying to go long, uh, any, like, let's say mining stock, but gold or SPX or gold or PPI had not broken out versus SPX then my rallies would fail. I didn't understand what was happening. I said, look, this is a classical TA pattern, should be breaking out, there's an implied measure move, they were failing. So you could reduce all these whipsaws by making sure that when you're above this sleep mode line, try not to go long. You go miners, yes, they could be some like a Kirkland Lake or Barrick that could go up, but most of them will not have the capital flows to have sustained rallies while this the, the PPI is underperforming SPX. Inverse happens here. When you're in this zone here, this is a zone where the miners will do well, etc. So that's the first the first big picture chart. And we know now it's broken down on a closed basis. It's not looking super good, guys. It's uh, The rally has failed. Now it's at support. If that fails, then it's really like a downtrend. Then there will be rallies up. All right. What I get after? Okay. So started to look at GDP, guys. Started looking at GDP. GDP keeps going up. And that was all fine. So what's the relation to GDP and the macro landscape? How could GDP help us understand? Are we in a stagflationary environment? Are we uh, going to have successive uh, recessions? But just looking at these charts, guys, whenever you see a chart from bottom left, top right, and they do like a, a curve going upwards, it's hard to dissect how that will help you. Markets react to rate of change. You have to apply a rate of change indicator or distance from moving average to any one of these charts where it's just continuously going up, up and up and up and up to extract some data of where you are in the cycles of this line going up. Is it expanding faster than usual? Is it contracting faster than usual? And only a rate of change will help you get that done, guys. So. What I have in this pane? In this pane right here, I have the seven year rate of change for GDP. So you'll see it up here, GDP, that's the uh, rate of change applied to that, and I have the seven year rate of change. So I'll say, okay, I'll, I'll, put up, I'll put up the seven year of change, I'll see. So you see that line that was going from bottom left to top right? Well, essentially, it's not going up as fast as it used to in the 70s. It's crazy as that. Look. Here you can't even tell, you think it's just going up and up and up, but that rate of change is not going up as fast. And it's been the GDP's seven year rate change has actually been dwindling since the 1980s. But then after that, whenever I see a chart and you guys, after seeing us do a whole bunch of charts, you're gonna start saying, hey Patrick, that looks like uh, the TNX chart, the 10 year yield chart. Yeah, it does. So let's put the 10-year or even oil or a whole bunch of other charts. 
So here I have the TNX, the 10 year yield. Just want to make sure I got that right. Yeah, the 10 year yield note. Everything's financialized. So the, the GDP, the rate of change, the seven year rate of change in GDP will have an impact on the 10 year yields, guys. Look at that. Tracks it pretty, pretty accurately. Or you could say the 10 year yield has an impact on the GDP. So why is that? Well, the 10 year yield going up, it's inflation. So if ever the yields are going up, that's a market telling you, well, there's inflation and we need to price the yields according to that. So the higher, the more inflation is creeping up, the more the yields are going up in a natural flowing market. Yeah. Gotta, this really is make, makes, makes you think, guys. So as those yields are going up, it's inflation, like really bad inflation. And you see here, the yields have broken out of a perfect, perfect descending channel. And like, oh man, debt can't sustain it. Uh, this has to go back down. Well, it's continuing up, guys. It's, I thought it did a pullback to the breakout line. We, I all thought maybe they, they do a yield curve control or something like that, right? So that's the danger of trying to apply a narrative or a cool story to what they have to do versus just observing the price and seeing what is happening. So always got to respect the price action. And if you derive a narrative from the price action, that's fine. But trying to apply a reason why the ratio, the 10-year yield cannot go up because of X and X and X reason, no matter how much it makes sense, that's a recipe for disaster. So for right now, the yield's going up. The seven-year rate of change for the GDP is going up because remember the GDP is has a high inflation component, right? So GDP, if it's the cost or the sales of all the products, well, if those prices of those items is going up because of inflation, not because it's like just additional products you're selling, putting on the market and con getting consumed, then that's why it tracks primarily that. All right. So this is telling me that when the TNX goes up and the GDP goes up, or when the, the TNX goes up, the 10-year yield goes up, you can expect the GDP to go up because the GDP has a high correlation with inflation. So that's part of it. Now we're going to do, we have to extract data because now we want to see the inflation component. Is it outpacing the GDP? So you want to remove, you want to see from the, for the GDP, is it going up because of the inflation? And now we see for the 10-year yield, since it tracked it, it's mostly that. And you want to see what's the natural growth of it. How, how is it at all-time high is the GDP? Is it able to create real GDP, right? And there is a, an instrument you could track called real GDP maintained by the Fed. I don't know if they still maintain it, but it was stripping away the inflation component from the GDP. And then you'd see the real growth. So let's look at this one, guys. This one is GDP adjusted for inflation. So yeah, there's been real growth, but look what happens when it stifles, when inflation, when you adjust GDP, and this would probably look similar to the inflation adjusted GDP, the real GDP. When this breaks down, look at that here. Inflation picks up, and then you're in an area where we know that silver outperforms. So GDP is not able to outperform inflation. GDP is not able to have real growth. And that's an environment where you're more likely to have recessions. The GDP is not able to always stay up above zero. Uh, even with inflation adjusted, you have recessions, right, in these sectors here. So that means that GDP is really, really having a hard time as it really crumbles downwards, even inflation adjusted, no, non-inflation, with the inflation component in it, it's able to go up. It's really not doing a good job, guys. So let's see here. Here's another line. That's more the line I want to take. You want to see slowdowns in GDP versus inflation. 
and then it's happening again. Look, I'll overlay the I'll overlay the silver chart on this one. Oh, that's right here. Do I have silver? Yeah, here. Take the silver chart. I'm gonna bring it all the way to that chart. Double click here. And look what happens when GDP sti gets stifled by inflation. Silver. As GDP gets destroyed by inflation, silver goes up. GDP reflates, silver goes sideways. This was in the 70s type environment. And when GDP gets destroyed by inflation once again, it goes up. But after that, higher low, something's happening. PPI is about to go down, less inflation. So the GDP is able to go up. Goes sideways, GDP outpacing inflation, fine. It slows down. And when it slows down, what happens? Silver breaks out. Even here, it was starting to fall, go sideways, cannot outpace inflation as much. And after that, while that goes, that area goes sideways, what happens? Silver goes up and up and up and up. All right, so here we have another phase, pretty much exactly to the top. This is pretty impressive, guys. This is marking exact tops. Look at that. Here, here. And well, don't know yet, right? Because now this thing has severely dropped. So this is the initial drop. And this is kind of akin to the 2008 guys. So as inflation has broken out versus GDP or GDP has broken out versus inflation, but that is such a shocker that it's creating, it broke down so hard, so fast, that it has created a recession, guys, right? There's GDP is a negative. Even with the inflation component, the GDP, the natural growth of GDP is not enough to remain above zero. And it's looking a lot like what we had in the 2000s, 2008 right here. 2008 right here. So that's the hard drop. Once the natural GDP is able to, to uh, garner a little bit of um, traction, but while being into, in an inflationary environment where the PPI is still outperforming it until this line, I don't know where it is yet, until this line is closed back above, right? What could I put? I'll put the oval. I'll put the rectangle here. See this area here? This area here? See this area here? That's where silver went ballistic. This area here, that's where silver went ballistic as that was going up. All below those rising trend lines, right? So that's where we are right here. We're something like that. The box it just went super low here, creating the, the drawdown in silver. So I'll move this, this line here. So until this, until GDP is able to outpace inflation again, so the inflation component is less and less important in the GDP. The GDP says, hey, I have inflation in me, but even when you adjust me, remove that inflation component, I'm able to go up, then that's pro-US equities, that's pro-growth, that's pro-economy, that's, that's great. That's great for, for US growth stocks, that's great for all of that. But right now, this is the initial hard, hard move down. And sometimes I've seen this in the charts. So we're it's like we're having a 2000 type of start. So this breakdown line here could even made it tighter maybe this breakdown line is like the 2000 start here when it broke down but we're breaking down with a bang we're breaking down with the the hardness the steepness that we had in 2008 so right off the bat we're starting with a big recession while we're rolling over just like we did in 2001 this is pretty pretty impressive stuff guys but once that downwards pressure alleviates and the GDP can re breathe then after that we should see silver and all that there really start climbing up while the GDP adjusted for inflation grinds sideways all right guys last chart this is the I'm going to keep those lines there they kind of match right the lines I drew here guys for the tops in silver Uh, well, this one here, I don't know yet about this one. So this is the rate of change for GDP divided by PPI, guys. So this is a seven-year rate of change, GDP, for the GDP divided by PPI. So now the, the important chart, 
that we spotted was the GDP adjusted for inflation. If it cannot outpace its in all its inflation incorporated component, I want to spot the changes in that because now we we we've seen that you know it's from bottom left to top right. Uh, but the drawdowns have been severe enough that we're able to spot these bull markets for commodities as it goes sideways. But I want to see the rate of change to give me more clues on where that is bringing us. So what I'm going to do is, okay, I keep clicking. I know, I know what to do, guys. Sorry. I'm going to click it, but I'm going to make it bigger. Squish. Uh, oh, yeah, here I could do that. Squish, squish, squish. Squish, squish, that one. Okay, here it is. So here I have the GDP divided by PPI. I have the silver chart overlaid. Now I have the seven-year rate of change. So the seven-year rate of change, so that line, you see it's going bottom left to top right, the yellow line. Well, for it to go up, that means the rate of change is usually going to be probably positive, right? And you see there's only a few occasions where that rate of change is negative. So that's really, really bad for the GDP if it's seven year rate of change. So that means if you're holding it today, if it bought it seven, if the chart, what it's telling you today is if I would have bought it seven years ago, that would be my return. So when it gets to these extremes that GDP has not been able to outpace inflation, there's something maybe. Maybe that's a time required for, for governments or the private sector to reindustrialize, create more supply, to fix what it needs to be fixed because of the excesses of when the inflation was the excesses of you know, the previous U.S. equities market or whatever it is. That's why it's hard, guys, when you try to always put reasons and narratives to why something has to move for it to crystallize in your head to make sense. You always follow the price action chart. So here's the top. So this is GDP opposing inflation, but then it just couldn't do it anymore. It's just like it's been performing too well. Inflation takes over, then it breaks down. Look at that. When that breaks down. It's pretty much close to the bottom for silver. Even here, pull little flag right here, it'll stagnate, and when it really falters. Bam, silver rockets, rockets here, reflates a little bit, silver stagnates, and then when it drops back down of that bear flag, bam, that explodes. And then it hits zero where people think, oh my God, GDP will never be able to outpace inflation. It will never go back up. And then that's when it gets seven-year rate of change, hits rock bottom. That's when it goes back up. Here, look at that, could have drawn a perfect trend line. That was actually, look at this beautiful line. This rate of change is really, really accurate for the inflation-adjusted GDP. Raise that. That was pretty much the bottom, the top for silver, and U.S. equities, you have to go long until you create a new up move. U.S. equities. Then creating a bigger top. And once that breaks down, what happened to silver? Silver goes up and up and up and up and up while inflation starts taking over versus GDP. So the portion of the GDP, even if it keeps going up from bottom left to top right, the portion of it is driven mostly by inflation, mostly by that TNX chart, right? And you got to notice this. I'll come back to this right now. This is what's impressive about the 2000 cycle for and that one. This is what's impressive for the, the, the cycle. While silver and gold went up and all commodities had a great run in the 2000s, it's this section here. It was within a secular disinflation cycle. Here there's an upswing here, 2003 all the way to 2007, then the crash. Then after that, try to reflate a little bit, 2009, but it couldn't get traction to, to break out. And then it was at the end of the, uh, see, as it stayed below the zone here, that was the end of the bull market for precious metals. That's what impressive. The price of gold moved so much, even while it was just a small reflation. Now, 
we're back in the 60s or 70s, late 60s, early 70s, guys. Look, we're right back at these levels. Stretch a line here. We're right back here in 1962 as this thing's starting to go up. So this is an environment where nobody's, not many people have seen this before, this type of behavior. So here we have a hard break. Here's another one. So right now this thing has fallen very, very hard and it's back at this 1979. So the seven year rate of change for GDP has totally, com totally crumbled. Um, are we going to get more recessions? We're probably in a recession right now. We'll get recessions. This is not looking super good. Now let's see what happens for gold and silver as this reflates. Let me pop in this. If it can stay in this zone here, and until that breaks out once again to the upside. So I don't know quite where it's going to be here. See, that breakout line was exactly where. So I'm not quite sure where that line is going to be. What angle? I look, they're pretty similar, these, uh, these durations. So something like this could happen, guys. And this would just be the bull era for precious metals for that area until it's able GDP. So that's a first hard hit. And like I said, we've had a hit as hard as we've had in 2008, but at the beginning of the cycle. So there's that's what happens when you start seeing correlations. You you always say, okay, this is it. This is a correlation. Oh, it looks like 2008. We're in 2008 today. And then after that, you take another vantage point and you say, oh, look, this looks like 1970. Okay, we're in 1970 today. Then you take another vantage point and say, oh, no, look, it's more like 2001 type of rollover after a dot-com bubble burst. That's where we are today. Well, it's all of those guys. So each of these, ha you can attribute a percentage, a probability to them. And then you have to kind of synthesize all of these elements together to grasp where the situation is. And that comes back to that Mark Twain tweet uh, thing that everybody says. History doesn't repeat but often rhymes. Well, that's exactly what it means. So overall, there are cycles that go up and down, up, longer up and down, up, shorter up and down. But they don't, but the way they go from up to down, it's not, oh, it's rarely exactly, exactly the same. Look at that, man. This, I just noticed that. Every time I look at a chart, I'm probably going to relook at that chart one day. The rate of change for GDP outpacing PPI is doing higher lows, lower highs, guys. This is interesting. See, it's not able, even in this run from 2011 to 2020, where US equities did great, it was not able to do as good as it did from 1980 to 89 or 1980 all the way to 2002. It pretty much stopped at the 2002 highs. Interesting. And the dot com bubble highs right there. And that's when it decided to totally break down. If I put a horizontal line there, yeah, it's an important pivot line. Excess breaks down, goes over, below, test, 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 lower, and now it just stopped right below instead of going above. So it's in the wrong place, guys. It's definitely in the wrong place. Is it going to go like that more? A little bounce, then up, then do a head and shoulders bottom. It's, it's always going to be different, a little bit different, guys. But us, we're going to keep... a, a an eye on this and until it closes back above this line or here support resistance support resistance resistance once it breaks out above it's important signals to get out all right guys that was pretty much it for me i'm gonna put this on the website and uh, hope you enjoy ciao guys